Good evening, everybody. Welcome again to the Glass Hour. Dennis McLean here, ably supported by Owen O'Sullivan. Uh, it's great to have all the feedback we've been receiving over the last two months for these online events. Uh, keep sending us the emails and we'll keep going. Uh, thank you also to those of you who've been making uh, donations to our chosen charity, the Edith Wilkins Foundation for Street Children in, Jar in Darjeeling. They're doing a fantastic job. As I told you last week, they're still receiving uh, new victims of abuse. Two young girls have been taken in last week. And I had some uh, photographs today which showed uh, the kids lining up with their face masks, etc., for medical checks. So, so far they've had no uh, cases of coronavirus at the, uh, at the residence. So all's going well there. It's a great pleasure tonight to introduce um, Christine Dwyer Hickey. Christine is a novelist, playwright, and short story writer. She has published eight novels, one collection of short stories, and a full-length play. Christine's work has been recognized with many awards, including Irish Novel of the Year for The Cold Eye of Heaven. Her other Dublin works include the Dublin Trilogy, the story of a Dublin family from 1918 to 1960, the short story collection, Parkgate Street and other Dublin stories. Last Train from Liguria, set in Italy during Mussolini's fascist regime, was nominated for the European Prize for Literature. Joseph O'Connor called it a powerfully accomplished work of art. Her latest novel, The Narrow Land, which we'll be talking about tonight, is on at least one shortlist for Novel of the Year and has also been shortlisted for the Walter Scott Prize for Historical Fiction. According to the citation from the Walter Scott judges, the narrow land is a quiet tour de force, placing art at the heart of historical fiction. By framing her portrait of the marriage of Edward and Josephine Hopper in one hot summer, 1950, at their house in Cape Cod, Christine Dwyer Hickey captures the intensity and sometimes destructiveness of the relationship and the impact on it when Michael, a child of a concentration camp, comes to stay nearby. Christine manages a rare thing. She reveals the impetus of Hopper's art, writing beautifully about light, angles and shade in an effortless way so that we only gradually and trillingly become aware that we are seeing things as Hopper did. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, Every year, the librarians of Dublin, Christine's own city, every year, the librarians of Dublin, a city associated with so many great writers, decide to celebrate one book. These have included James Joyce's Dubliners, Bram Stoker's Dracula, Roddy Doyle's Barrytown Trilogy, Oscar Wilde's Portrait of Dorian Gray, and this year, they have chosen a modern day classic, Tatty by Christine Dwyer Hickey. You're very welcome, Christine. Thanks, Dennis. To the glass hour. How are things there in Dublin? How's the lockdown treating you? It's okay. It's not much different to my ordinary life, I have to say. It's just uh, a little bit less sociable. But we've lovely sunshine, so that seems to be the consoling everybody. We're not used to having such beautiful summers uh, and such consistently beautiful summers so far. We've had very little bad weather. So, you know, we're getting there. We're getting there. Good, good. Normally, I think, Christine, both of us would be in the stove this evening. Yeah, I know. And especially I know. this year, because it's the 50th anniversary of uh, the Stowell Writers' Week, which is probably one of the oldest uh, literary festivals in Europe. I think so, yeah. Maybe the first one in Ireland. Uh, yeah. yeah, I know. We would have been really celebrating. Mm. It's a shame. Um, this it's been part of my life for so long and this time this time last year actually i was getting ready to go on stage to be interviewed by niall mcmonagall about the narrow land and you know it is it seems funny to be talking to you dennis and not be in the store not be yeah. across the table or, yeah. or a bar or in a bar but um anyway hopefully they'll come back and they'll they'll, they'll have an even bigger celebration next year that's the yeah. plan anyway one, one of the great things about Lestole, one of the things that makes it very unique is the encouragement it gives to young writers. Mm. And I think uh, it, has a, it had a great in, influence on yourself, no? Well, when I went to Lestole in the beginning, I wasn't a writer. 
I actually thought I was going to the races. <laughs> in my house, that's where what the show meant. My father went to the races there every September. But we were friendly. My husband and myself were, were young and, and friendly with um, uh, poet Michael Hartnett. And he asked us, would we like to go down with him? And that's how we got involved. And shortly after that, you see, for me, it, there was a sneaky desire to be a writer, but I fought it for a long time. Mm. But I think Lestole gave me the impetus. And then I started to, to write, you know, I say, I wrote a novel in about three months, which is a ridiculous amount of time to write a novel in. Showed it to Michael. He was very impressed with the alliteration in it and thought it was, you know, funny, but he did give me encouragement. And uh, that kind of got me going. And then after that, I used to go down every, I thought it was such fun. It was such a great crack when you were down there. That yeah. every year I went down until Mary Keane, wife of John B. Keane, told me, you are not to come down here again anymore unless you've got something written. And I was afraid of my life of her, so I did. I wrote, started to write then. So it was Mary, not John B. himself. Not really John B. Now afterwards, when I, when I won the, the short story competition the first time, I had already met John with, um, with Michael. And we, all, we, we were in his company lots of times and had great fun. I mean, it was some company to be in with Michael. He was so relaxed with John B. And he wasn't always like that with other, with other writers. Mm. So they were great fun together. Really, really great fun. Uh, but he did encourage me once I started to write. He talked to me about it. And he'd, he'd, my first novel actually was launched alongside a book of his. And he did it uh, out of, you know, because he felt sorry for me, I'd say. And at that point, I'd say there was about seven people in my queue to get the book signed. And I knew it was probably related to most of them. Whereas his queue was winding out the door and down the road and <laughs> for his hotel. But anyway, it was such an honor for, for me to be, you know, even on the same platform as him. Uh, what book was that? The Dancer, the very the first book. The first book of the yeah. Dublin trilogy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But just uh, stepping back a bit from that, I mean, your first success in Le Stole was winning the short story uh, That's right, yeah. competition. Yeah. You know, we, have, we have a lot of people listening to this who are, uh, you know, would be writers as well, you know, they're coming from the Geneva yeah. Writers Group. So they'd be interested to hear how you, what was the initial impetus for you to sit down and write that story? Um, well, I had, I actually was by myself in a position where I'd fallen, had an accident. I'd fallen off a horse and broken my collarbone. So I couldn't even write. And I had my arm up in a little sling like that, you know, mm. and during a very long summer. And I had a long think about what I really wanted to do with myself. I mean, I was, we had our children very young. I was still, you know, in my twenties when I had all my, when my children, were, that was finished. They were in starting school, they were in school and I have more time in my hands and I just sort of thought, look, you're going to have to do it. Just try it for a year. And if you can't, if nothing happens after a year, you can forget about it then. Because you have to be very courageous to, to start to write. And that was the main thing, to take that leap. Because it's much easier to say, oh, I could have written or I should have written than to say I did it and I couldn't. And I, and I just wasn't any good at it. So anyway, with my little gammy arm, I bought myself two big uh, Foods Cap Easton's copy books. And I gave myself a half an hour a day for two months first. So I would write like this uh, in the, for, the, for half an hour, anything that came into my head. And the next day I'd take the second copy and look what I'd written the day before and cross, get rid of some things, add things, build it up that way. So eventually I had a story. The first story was dreadful. The second one was even worse. God, the third one, they were just getting worse by the minute. <laughs> then I just suddenly thought about writing a story about a little girl going to the races with her dad, which I would know that experience really, really well. And I sat and I closed my eyes and I looked at myself as a child and I looked at the Phoenix Park race course in my head. And, uh, and I just walked that child through the race course and I just left it, I just relaxed and I just sort of just took a deep breath and went for it. And my half an hour just broke through the half an hour and I just kept writing. And I knew when I finished that I had a story. I just stayed in the child's mind, used the child's point of view. And it's how I write now, whatever character I'm writing about, I don't think about myself. I don't think about, you know, the, the, my use of language. It's all about the character and what the character sees and hears and thinks. And that's Fantastic. how, yeah. But anyway, I sent it off <laughs> and, uh, and it won. Wow. And yeah, I've won and it was just the most, 
you know, I think if, even if I won the Nobel Prize, I anything would give me that thrill that I had that time and I won the competition. You know, I rang my husband, he was in work to tell him, and I was sobbing so much. He thought someone had died. I just, I don't know what it was. It was like, I always kind of knew it was there, but this yeah. was the first validation to say that I, I could do it. Fantastic. Yeah. And uh, what, I, I mean, you, you not only won it that year, but you went on to win it again the next year. Oh, and no, that was a different thing. That my reasons were actually pure. But then we went down to get the prize and then it was 500 quid. I think it's 2000 or something now. Hmm. Sure, I was outside the bank with my check in my hand the very first thing the next morning on the Thursday morning. And, uh, and, and I had it all spent. I had about 40 quid going home. You know, if we spent it all, I was buying a drink for everybody. Just really delighted. And on the way home, I said to, to, to my husband, Dennis, oh, that was brilliant fun. That was just great fun. We'll go, will we go down again next year? And he said, oh, sure, you couldn't go down. Go. Like it's all very well, he said, but like cost your fortune. Look at all the money you have to spend, and I'm, you know, you'd be wrecked after it, and blah, blah blah. So then I thought, oh God, what am I going to do? And I thought, God, I'll try and win it again. So we get back again, and I did. But you can't keep doing that, you know. Yeah. So the second year again. All expenses paid trip. To all expenses school. paid, yeah, because yeah, because yeah, they also put you up for a night in the hotel. So that's the start. Yeah. Add to that, you know. Well, to to uh, mark the weekend that's in it, uh, Christine. Would you like to read us something which evokes something of the spirit of those, yeah. those days, those years? This is a piece that, that was, um, Michael Hartnett is in it. And it's about the first journey down to the stove. Maybe, maybe for people who don't know uh, Michael and his work, because sadly, Oh God, he, don't he, say he, that. Yeah. Do you think yeah. of people who don't know? He was a poet, died, yeah. he died quite young. Yeah. And, um, but he was a wonderful, really, really wonderful poet. And he was such a modest man, such a shy man. And um, I often think of him, I have to say, and I think that, that that shyness inside him probably was the reason why he tended to drink. He drank a lot on it. In the end, then his liver packed in and he died quite young. But anyway, he was, he was a lovely man, hugely intelligent, one of the most intelligent people I'd ever met. But this tells a little bit about him. Okay. Lovely. Um, Michael Hartnett left us 10 years ago. I should say that when I wrote this piece, we were in, it was 10 years after he died and we were into the Stowe Writers Week and this was broadcast for radio. So I can't remember what year that was now, to be honest. But anyway, it's, it's more than 10 years ago. Michael Hartnett left us 10 years ago and I think of him often, but it's at this time of the year that I really miss him. He was the one who introduced us, my husband, Dennis and I, to the Stowe Writers Week and it's been part of our lives ever since. That was over 20 years ago when, on a beautiful late May morning, we set off in a borrowed car with just about enough money to stretch to one overnight stay. We'd arranged to meet Michael in Inchicore outside McDowell's pub. Outside because, and it was probably just as well, it was too early to go in. He was sitting on the curb, puffing on a fag, cap slightly back on his head, elbow resting on a small skyscraper of boxes full of his books, copies of the wonderful Inchicor haiku. And so we began on the slow, very slow road to Kerry. In fact, it would take us 10 hours to get there. I won't go into all the details, the pubs along the way, the sing song and limerick competition that kept us going across that endless county of Tipperary. All that we learned from him mythology, poetry, and gossip so delicious it was highly unlikely. How in the back seat of the car he conjured himself out of his everyday clothes into a brown outfit that had been removed from a corpse of similar stature and sent to him from America, and to which he always referred to as his $20 suit. Enough to say that many pubs later, we hold up at what Michael had promised to be our very last pit stop. What a bleak barn of a place that was. I had been instructed to bring a posh frock, which I did, along with shoes with heels on them and earrings as big as cabbages, Michael's words, not mine. I had also been assured that there would be plenty of time to rest, change and look fabulous by the opening ceremony in the local hotel in the Stowe, which is to take place at seven o'clock. As we were still in Limerick and the six o'clock news had just hit the telly, I was beginning to have my doubts. Then the door fell open. 
a large man, spectacularly drunk, fell in after it. We watched him for a moment, hanging onto the swinging door for support until Dennis went over and steadied him up. When the man, let's call him Noel, recognised Michael, his face crumpled in despair. I'm back on the drink, Michael, he said, 20 years off it, and now I'm back on the drink. So I see Noel, Michael gently replied. Noel repeated that mantra for a while, then told us that he had just made a big sale, a field, maybe cattle. I couldn't quite make out what he said. Whatever it was, he was clear on one thing. His money was no good to him now. I'm finished anyhow, he said. It's all over, that's all. Then the man began to sob. The wife had left, taking the kids. I thought it might be best to take myself off to her past to the ladies and get the frock business out of the way. I was half dressed when I heard footsteps going into the gents' toilet next door. A few seconds later, they were joined by another set of footsteps, heavier this time and less certain. The wall between us planked thin, so it wasn't really a question of eavesdropping. Will you not take a few quid, Michael? Knowles asked. I won't, Michael said. Thanks all the same. Ah, please, Michael, I'd like you to have a few quid. It's no good to me now, and I know you could do with it. I can't take it, no, Michael insisted. Just a couple of hundred, what harm? And so it went on for a while, Michael's friend begging him to take the money, Michael refusing. Meanwhile, there I stood, half in, half out of the dress, on the far side of the wall. I heard Michael leave the gents. When I came out, he was waiting at the door, Dennis already in the car, engine revving. Let's get out of here, Michael said, quick now, while he's still in the jacks. I was trotting up the road then on high heels, Michael ahead of me, Noel coming up the rear in a clumsy lumber. The car pulled away. Through the window, I watched poor Noel fling notes like confetti after it. We made one more stop that evening, not to a pub, but to a little house up the side of a mountain. It was to see Michael's family. I didn't know too much about Michael's circumstances then, except that he had two children and was separated from his wife. We stayed with the children while he and his wife went into another room to talk. I cannot say we heard raised voices or any words at all, but I had come from a separated home myself and I had the sense that in that troubled room, money was probably an issue. We left then driving into the twilight, Michael suddenly quiet. And I thought of all that cash lying like dead leaves over the deserted road somewhere in West Limerick and of the man and the gents trying to force a few hundred on Michael and how easy it would have been for him to take it. There were many sides to Michael Hartnett, umpteen stories about him. This happens to be one about a virtuous man. That's it. Beautiful story, Christine. I, see, I, I know, I get upset even reading it after all yeah, these years. <laughs> it made a great impression on me when I heard it for the first time yeah. in, uh, in, in, in the show. Uh, wonderful story. And uh, that was after Michael had started writing in English again. Yes, that's right. After, after dismissing it as a language fit only to sell pigs in, with <laughs> something like that. Yeah, I know, yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. no, what a, good, what a great loss he is. Yeah. So but anyway, if anyone hasn't read his poetry, I'd really yeah. recommend it. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's uniquely beautiful. It's really beautiful poetry. Yeah, absolutely. So that's the stole, Christine. Another that's place that's very dear to you is, of course, your own native Dublin. Yeah, well, we have a love hate relationship. Sometimes, you know, I fall out with it. But yeah, I love, I love Dublin, really. Yeah, and uh, it must have meant a lot to you when uh, it was announced that uh, Dublin City was going to recognise your great novel, I know. Tatty, I, uh, this year. Unfortunately, I know. the timing was terrible. Listen, I've had nothing but bad luck. I mean, I have had lots of good luck this year. I really have yeah. had lots of good yeah. luck. But it's all, it's all of it has been tempered by the bad luck of not, you know, being able yeah. to make the most of it. Um, yeah, Tatty, I got a, an email last, the end of last summer, to tell me. And when I looked at the email, I thought they were actually asking me to speak to camera about whoever had received it. I didn't actually think it was me. And because uh, that, the, the, that year, Edna O'Brien had won it. And they'd asked me in to come and speak to camera about Edna O'Brien. So I presumed it was the same thing. And I was looking at the email thinking, what's Tatty's name doing there? It must be somebody who liked Tatty, you know? And I wasn't paying, and then I had to read it. And then I read it again. And then I said, oh my God, it's me. The one city, one book is me. 
So anyway, we had huge plans. Oh, we had really big plans. I was supposed to be going to Poland and the, the um, Oxford and, oh God, where else? Going? The Irish Embassy in London, loads of places. And the flags were to fly, banners of Tatty up and down the Liffey. Wow. That's all, that's what they do at the one city. Yeah, one. yeah, I know it's From fantastic. The publishers, though. yeah, they really go all out. And a big, big, what they were calling the flag, flagship event was to take place in Liberty Hall with, again, a big, big picture of Tatty up on the front of Liberty Hall. And um, that was, you know, that's quite a, quite a sizable venue. And I was to be, it was about the music that has inspired my life. And I had a concert pianist lined up and an Ilham Piper, my brother's an Ilham Piper, so I got him in on that and a trumpet player. And, you know, anyway, all gone now, I'm afraid. Yeah. Even after the lockdown, the lift of lockdown, surely that... I don't know, because, because of the spacing situation. I think it's a very, very difficult time, particularly for actors, I have to say, theatres, mm. anything to do with theatres. Like, say if somewhere, like even the concert hall has a capacity of 2,000, they can only let a third of the people in. Mm. So it's going to be very difficult to even make, even come out even. You wouldn't come out even, you'd be working at a loss. So that's all pretty difficult. And so I don't know what's going to happen. We just play it by ear. Look, so many people have died and lost people and had terrible times, lost their living and everything that I feel it's churlish kind of to go moan yeah. and complain about it, but still, you know. Yeah. Well, tell us about the genesis of Tati. What, what, where, did, mm. where did the story come from? Well, the story came, it's story's my own story. And I think really when I talked about that very first short story, which was 1992, um, Tatty was published in 2004 and I started to write it maybe three years before that, maybe even four years before that. And um, what happened was, uh, it's a similar character. It's like the, the short story was a precursor for Tatty. And um, sometimes there's unfinished business, you know, that's happened to me a couple of times. That little character walking around the race course, she always stayed in my head as if to say, you know, I'm still here. And a couple of different things happened. One was, in the meantime, my father had died. He died and um, I was having difficulty getting over his death and I kept, I was very sad about his life and about the way things turned out and all that kind of stuff and it's, it's a very complex situation, you know, um, and in the, in the end, in order to stop feeling so sad, I went to see a therapist and, you know, we got on fine just to talk about it and to talk about different issues within my family life when I was a child and, um, I come from what they call an alcoholic family. My father had a problem and so did my mother. And so it's quite difficult to bring these, anyone who's, who's listening will know about this. You, you tend to bring these issues on into your, into your adult life. So anyway, um, she said to me, why don't you write a little story about it? Well, come from the child's point of view. And that way you can see that nothing, the you cannot blame a child for, thing, for these things that happen to adults. So I said, okay, I do it. So I was doing it and I was sort of having a little cry and I'd write a bit and I'd write a bit and have another little cry and say, oh God, that's, you know. And then suddenly the, the ruthless novelist clicked into my head and said, oh God, this is not bad. This is quite good. So I just kind of kept going and I kept going and I realised I'm going to keep going with this. Yeah, thankfully for all of the readers. I mean, I've yeah. been reading it now the last week and it's just beautiful. You know what, it, 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 the style of it reminds me of the opening page of Portrait of an Artist as a Young Man. You yeah. know, there was baby, that baby the, talk that opens. The baby the, talk, yeah. yeah. I yeah. tried actually, to, what I tried to do was something that, that he did in a much more intellectual way, I'd say. Well, he, he goes to, to an older, a much older child. Um, I tried to do the thing where the voice changes uh, in, with every chapter. It's episodic. And so every year she's a year older. And so the voice that you're using changes to suit her age. And, um, you know, like when I was writing it, I, the very first time I made myself the size of a five-year-old and I was kind of, you know, looking at the world from then and then I get a little bit taller and a little bit taller. Mm. And, uh, and, th and that's the way I sort of worked it out. Yeah, it's very powerful, very effective technique. Yeah. Would you like to read something, a passage? Well, I read voice? a little bit from it. Yeah, um, this is very much sort of part of my childhood growing up. And um, I spent a lot of the formative years in the company of my father. And uh, I'm the only girl, I've got four brothers. And um, I, I, I would go to the races with them and I go to all these different places with them. But anyway, this is sort of uh, a typical situation. 
off you go. Okay. When you go out with the men, you go to the pub. You get hooshed up on the bar stool. You get to do things you're not supposed to tell mam about. Sometimes you get a little pint of stout. A pint for me, dad says, and a little pint for my pal here. It tastes like black buttermilk, sour and thick. It stings the tubes in the inside of your ears on the way down. But you drink it all up and go, ah, the way dad does, and wipe your mouth on the back of your hand. Then you say, I want to go to the toilet, even if you don't. And you get lifted down off the stool and the men forget all about you. You can turn on all the taps. You can make the toilets have a race, running in and out, flushing all the chains. You can open all the doors and slap them shut again. You can come back outside and crawl all over the long bouncy seats by the wall. In some of the pubs, you can find out where the pub man's wife is, and it's always in the kitchen. Sometimes the kitchen is up the dark stairs, the whole house up there with a living room and a dining room and all. One of them even has a piano on the landing, but sometimes it's down the cold yard past the jerky red chickens, or else it might be just in the back through the bar. She likes when you have to go through the bar. You can look at all the bottles squeezed into their shelves, orange, black, raspberry, lemon, and the cues of glasses and the mustard jars and the big cardboard box with the shuffly crisp bags inside. There's the bin where the barman throws all the cigarette ends and the squashed up napkins and the fat from the ham. There's this mixed up footprints all over the sawdust, silver bottle tops, blobs of spilled stout. There's the low down sink where he washes his glasses and the high up box where he keeps all the bets. You can see all these things when you walk through the bar and when you get to the end, you turn around to make sure you're going the right way. Then the barman says, go on, don't be shy, go on through, she won't mind. And the next thing is you're in the kitchen. Then the pub man's wife might ask, did you have your dinner? And you always, always say no. Because you get funny dinners in other people's kitchens. Dinners that don't taste the same as man's. It might be the same stuff, but they match it in a different way on the plate. And that's why it just doesn't taste the same. She got the heel of a roast heart stuffed in the middle and another time a dippy egg and turnips cut up like chips. She got five Kimberly biscuits and tea in a mug after one dinner. And that was a bit greedy, like eating two meals at one go because Mam only gives you two biscuits and only a tea time. Once you got white pudding and mashed potatoes and stuff out of a tin that looked like sick but was called Russian salad. And that was the funniest dinner of all. The woman who makes your dinner might ask you your business. And even though Mam always warns her, don't be telling those nosy owl ones all your business. Sometimes she gets mixed up and forgets. And it's hard to know what you're allowed to tell or not because one minute it's Tell the truth and shame the devil. The next minute it's, ah, what did you have to go and tell them that for? I could kill you stone dead. Mam says, when someone asks you your business, all you have to say is, I don't know. But the questions about your business are nearly always the same. Like, do you have a telly? And how many bedrooms and brothers and sisters? And that would be too stupid not to know if you had a telly or not, or how many bedrooms or brothers and sisters. The woman with the Kimberly Biscuits asked her different questions. The woman with the Kimberly Biscuits asked, how is your mammy and is she still a real glam puss? What's a glam puss? Does she still wear beautiful clothes? I don't know. Well, is she still lovely and slim then? Oh no, her tummy's still a good bit fat after getting baby Luke. Another one? My God, he didn't give her much of a break, did he? The woman with the Kimberly Biscuits had a telly in her kitchen and a man and a woman were having a row on the telly. The Kimberly woman said she knew dad from before and he was a real heartbreaker and no one could believe it when he finally got married to a young one like ma'am. Then she started looking at the telly. And the woman on the telly was wearing a frilly pinny. She had her hand on her hip and kept shaking her finger at the man and every time she gave out to him again, people you couldn't see kept on laughing all over the place. Does your mammy ever give out to your daddy? The Kimberly woman asked her. I don't know, she said. Like if he came home drunk, would she give out stink to him? I don't know. Oh, isn't that great? Your mammy must be very easygoing. So is she? Um, so your mammy and daddy never fight then, is that what you're telling me? Do you mean like a boxing match? No, like a row, like that pair on the telly. I don't know. 
I mightn't hear them if I was asleep, but I'd hear all the people laughing. I know the Kimberly woman said, there wouldn't be anyone laughing. That's not real, that's just the telly. Oh, well, I don't know because I mightn't hear them anyway. I mightn't hear them if they were shouting and calling each other names. I might know if mum was screaming and dad was slamming doors and then if mum was crying in the living room on her own. Well, I might know that. Is that right now? The Kimberly woman said. It made her feel kind of itchy, the Kimberly woman asking her about mum and dad. It made her feel kind of ashamed and afraid as well in case she might have said something by mistake and maybe now she'd get in big trouble with mum. So the next time a pub man's wife asked her business, she didn't say, I don't know. She told fibs instead. She said they had three tellies and 10 bedrooms and that mum wore her wedding dress and a big hat when she was washing the dishes, sweeping the floor. And that made the woman laugh all over the place and call her a hard nut. Oh, you're a real hard nut, the woman said, and started laughing again. It was nice being able to make the woman laugh. It was nice, and it was much easier than telling the truth. Oh, that's beautiful, Christine. So good. <laughs> There's so much in that, you know, humour, wisdom, yeah. love, and, you know, so, but lots of sorrow as well, I guess, running yeah. through it. Absolutely wonderful. We have a question here from Ursula Heim, who asks... Uh, do you ever feel like revisiting any of the characters in your books? You know, I guess Tatty, I mean, would you ever think I of... did it. No, I'm done with her now. I think I'm done. I'm done. Yeah. I'll do it again. Um, I think with Tatty, I mean, a lot of people really liked it and they wrote letters to me and it seemed to help a lot of people. Mm. But I don't know, even a wonderful thing like One City, One Book was a mixed blessing in a way because you were in a position where you had to speak about it and... Yeah. Beginning, I thought this. Then I decided I was comfortable about talking about it. I was going to speak about it because it's high time somebody did, you know. But anyway, but at the same time, I would have to deal with myself as a teenager, the teenage years and the other years and all. And mm -hmm. I don't know. Who knows? I don't think so. Christine, I'm sorry, but there, yeah. there's a lot of light on your lovely face. We can't oh, I quite see, see it. I, 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 the, the Dublin sunshine. <laughs> the, you're, you're, the sun is setting. Do you want to pull down the blind? Maybe that would be best, yeah. I'll do that, yeah. We'll Excuse me for that. No problem. You can all talk among yourselves for uh, a few yeah. seconds. And don't forget that we're taking questions from uh, viewers. So if anybody would okay. like to ask Christine something, please. Is that better? Uh, that's perfect, Christine. Thank okay. You. So anyway, but I did the same, a similar thing um, a few years ago with The Cold Eye of Heaven. It started yeah. life as a short story called The Fly Fisher. And it was stuck in the back of my head. And the fly fisher was about a man who, an elderly man who wakes up uh, after having a stroke on, and lying on the bathroom floor. And he starts to think a little bit about his life and he's wondering, will he be rescued? And all this kind of stuff. But it was a short story um, and uh, called the fly fisher. And then he just kept coming back to me. And uh, I, um, and I wrote the, I wrote the cold eye of heaven. I took the, first, the short story, did a little bit of cut and shape, and that was the first chapter. And then after that, I, I went. The Cold Eye of Heaven regressed rather than progressed. That's right, yeah. yeah. And it's every yeah. 10 years and it goes back. Yeah. And it won the uh, Irish Novel of the Year Award. It did, yeah. It did, yeah. 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 Another great success. And again, it was set in Dublin, yeah. It was set in Dublin. So it wasn't just the story of the man over 75 years, it's the story of Dublin over 75 years. Yeah. How important is that? We, I, I was saying to you before we get, went live that uh, mm. Colm Tobin, who we had on a couple of weeks ago, was saying that he could never write about Dublin because it just isn't his city, even though yeah. he spent you know, many years living in Dublin, but he just didn't feel that uh, Dubliners yeah. would take him. Uh, yeah. You know. He could write as an outsider in Dublin. Yeah. Nobody's yeah. doing that. I think that's interesting. Mm. Somebody coming to Dublin who, does, who, who isn't from there. Nobody really does that that much, I think. Um, Michael Hartner could write about Dublin, but there was poetry. Maybe that's different. The Inchicore in haiku. Yeah, it's really wonderful. Yeah. It's all sort of about the recession in Dublin, and it's, it's, it's just very, uh, it's, it's very success, it's successfully done. I think it's a brilliant piece of work. Um, for me, yeah, I mean, I'm more comfortable probably writing about Dublin. I know it very well from you know, pub crawling from the time I could walk with my father to even Mitching School when um, I was uh, in first and second year. 
I hated the school and I, 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 you know, I just couldn't, the news, it was a new school. I had been a boarding school and I'd just gone into a day school and I just couldn't take it at all. And I used to go on the hop on my own. It's not very much fun on your own, but I got to know an awful lot of, um, of Dublin doing it that way. Yeah. A quick word. How do you think Dublin has uh, changed? Massively. In the last... I was thinking about, I was just writing a piece to, about James Joyce and um, about his life and his childhood. And I was thinking about, my grandmother was from Clonaf Road. My aunt lived in Clonaf Road and another aunt in another part of Drumcondra. So all those roads where the Joyces lived in several different houses, I knew all those streets very well. And the Dublin then that I knew when I was a teenager and up to probably the late 80s had largely remained the same. I mean, there was a few eyesores here and there, a few mutilations, but you know, that you had the same things that were in Dubliners, that were mentioned in Dubliners and in Ulysses, the same shops and the same streets and the same kind of people even, you know? Mm. So the big changes happened, started to happen in the late 1980s and then the 90s and, you know, the whole, the whole of the docks just completely, you wouldn't recognise it. It's a different city. And I think, um, I mean, you probably noticed it more yourself from where every time you come back, you probably noticed something else changed. Yeah, I left Dublin in, on the day that the Berlin Wall fell in 1989. Right. And, yeah. and uh, you know, Dublin went through a transformation almost on the same scale as Germany, I think. Yeah, after just, reunification. It's just extraordinary. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. extraordinary. Anyway, um, Christine, coming on to uh, the narrow land, yeah. which, uh, which has also been a huge success for you. Um, what was the inspiration for that? Because that that's, of course... Uh, taking you to completely new territory it's so you're yeah not, you're not in your home I know. Uh, city and that well i see i kind of i kind of get uncomfortable when i'm labeled like say after the, there have been the cold eye of heaven and then there have been the park eight stories the short stories and and tatty and there are three very very dublin books and i i was beginning to sort of people were, were always introduced me as a dublin writer and this and i sort of thought I don't want to label, I want to try something different. So then I did Last Train from Liguria, which is set in Italy during the fascist period, and a little bit in Dublin as well in the 90s, and then in the 1990s. But then I decided, um, I, I, I don't know, I didn't deliberately decide to go to Cape Cod. It happened, these things often happen in, in little stages and by accident. So a good few years ago, I was at a dinner in Leipzig, I was at a book fair in Leipzig, and I was sitting beside a German guy and um, his name, and he said, he, I, I, I'm going to tell you a story. And his name is Hans Christian. So of course you're going to listen to someone called Hans Christian telling a story. And his story was about the German children after the Second World War and the malnutrition and how they were all, you know, they were all starving. There was just, there was just so much poverty and how they were all sent off on trains to farms to be fattened up. And you had to eat lumps of butter and drink loads of milk and all that kind of thing. And some of the kids, who had no parents, who had been in holding camps, were then sent on to America, you know. And um, so at that stage, I could picture this. I said to him, oh God, like little piggies gone off to the farm. And he said, exactly, that's exactly what it was. So that stage, in my mind, the idea of a little boy in patched up clothes on a train, not knowing anybody, at about five years of age, who'd been an orphan, like for about three years or two years already, and been sent off to be fattened up and then sent off to America. And then I read up a bit about um, President Truman, who's the complete opposite to the present incumbent in that he, he, had, um, he, he, he brought out this decree that he wanted all children in holding camps, as many as possible. Don't worry about who they are, what they are, where they come from. I don't care if their parents were Holocaust victims or Nazi soldiers or whatever, SS officers. I want them brought to America and we, we'll organize their papers and we'll try and get them adopted and give them a chance in life. So that stuck in my head too. So anyway, I was in Cape Cod uh, because we were in Boston at a book fair and we went to Cape Cod for, the, for, for a couple of days. And um, I saw an Edward Hopper tour and we went on the Edward Hopper tour and it consisted of just myself and Dennis and what, this, this little mad woman driving us around the place. And she didn't really tell me anything about Edward Hopper except a few bits of gossip that sounded a bit unlikely, but anyway, um, the light really struck me. The light, I just was quietly looking out the car and, and, and also the vast amount of space where there's nobody, you don't see anybody. It's like being at the edge of the world. You don't really see anybody. 
And this is up at the very top of the Cape. And um, I just started, I always liked out a topper, but I just said to myself, I'm going to bring the little boy here. Somehow I'll bring the little boy here. I don't know how. And maybe he can see Edward Topper painting on the side of a hill with his wife. They were both painters painting on the side of the hill. So that was my plan at that point. So I came home and I started to write the train scene, the little boy. You know, he's in New York. He's been adopted by a working class New York family. He's given a lot of trouble and they're sending him off to Cape Cod to stay with, to keep comp company of, a, of an American boy who lost his father in the war. And I, I was as far as that. And um, then out of the blue, I found out that I had cancer in my kidney and I had to have a kidney removed. So that was the end of me for a while. And I was just sort of, oh God, you know. So I was very sick. And when I came out, I had a rough time recovering and insomnia and all sorts of carry on. And I used to be able to sleep. So during the day, I'd come down and lie on the sofa and I'd watch um, the television. And I had recorded a documentary about Edward Hopper, just for the landscape of Cape Cod, really. And I started to watch it and I'd fall asleep. And I used to do my sleeping with his voice when he'd be talking, he'd a real slow, steady voice, really slow, slow delivery. And then bit by bit, I'd stayed awake more and more often, you know, I'd stay longer periods of time. And it just, him, himself and his wife, they just kind of got in in my head and they took over the novel. So they kind of became about them. Wow, that's quite a story yeah. in itself. So about that's, thing. I think, how most novels go. If you let it, you know, mm. things happen. Yeah. It happen to you and use them as they come up. Sounds like you could have an, an, a Hopper app to help you sleep. Yeah. <laughs> Just the sound of his voice. Yeah. yeah, it was great. Just the sound of his voice. And the sea. You could see that. It's like molten silver. The Cape Cod of the Light and the way it rolled and the kind of music. It's a wonderful documentary, actually. Vin Vanders directed. Is Hopper, is Hopper a big deal in Cape Cod? For he is, yeah, he is yeah. kind of a big yeah. deal, yeah. He is. Yeah. He's a he... wonderful painter, I think. Um, and it's very hard to see how powerful he is until you see it. In, in, you're actually standing in front of one of his paintings. Books don't do them justice. Mm. So I decided to explore. They had a kind of a very tempestuous relationship, him and his wife. He was six foot seven, slow speaker. She was a little small. She was five foot, never stopped talking. She talked like that, you know. And um, there, was, there was a lot of conflict in the marriage, which was, was interesting as well, you know. Would you like to read a passage for us? Would you like me to read it? Are, are you I sure you've been reading too much? Do you want to talk to me instead? I don't mind. No, I think uh, we'd like to hear something from it. Yeah. Okay. Right, well, I'm going to read this little bit because most of your listeners, I'm sure, are readers. And this is a kind of a little section where Hopper, you know, talks about reading and also because I'm always very interested in the child within the adult. And so we have a little bit of that as well. He, this is 1950 in Cape Cod. He gets up early to read. Most mornings he manages an hour or so before his wife begins to stir. If she's still sleeping when the hour is done, he may attempt to work. If it happens to be one of those days when the studio seems more like a place of incarceration, he will put down his book, close the door behind him and go out for a walk. When he reads, he opens back the Dutch door to let in the morning air. He sits into his chair, puts his feet up on the chaise long, keeps the coffee pot close to hand. Then he opens his book and he is a fly on the wall at someone else's party. It's for the same reason he has always enjoyed going to the movies. His wife usually starts talking as soon as she stirs. He hopes today won't be one of those days. Sometimes she would start even before she opens her eyes. She may say something like, how's the weather doing out there? Or, you know, I had the strangest dream last night. For the past few days, the first words out of her mouth have been in the form of a question. The same question. Do you think we might get any news from New York today? He will usually respond, calling out from the kitchen or studio or coming to stand in the doorway of the bedroom, he may say, looks about the same as it did yesterday, or dreams are supposed to be strange. For the past few days though, it has been the same answer. It's hard to get hold of anyone in New York this time of year. He's probably closed up the gallery and gone on vacation. 
When he reads at a solitary hour, there is a calmness around him, a suspension of time. The pain in his lower gut lifts, contentment appeases him. It is only when he moves his position or maybe reaches out to refill the coffee cup that his eye will be caught by the light. He will notice then the latest stain left by the sun on the surface of the room. Each time he happens to look up, the shape of the stain will have changed. The intensity of light will be altered. From the first chrome yellow stripe on the floor to the last wedge of white through the open door. And he will be aware once again that the axis is turning, that even at this hour of the morning, the day is already moving towards death. He recalls Harry Sterner, a reformed drunk who used to drop by his father's store from time to time. The only thing he missed about being a drunk, Harry used to say, was the suspension of time. A whole day would stop so long as he was prepared to walk into a bar and surrender himself to the bottle. He has experienced this feeling from time to time, not through booze, but through work. Some paintings more than others, some paintings not at all. But for him, it has always come in short spurts, the piece dissip dissipating the moment he steps away from the canvas. Apart from that one summer, the summer of endless rain when he decided to accept defeat, give up looking for a subject and put away his brushes. He took to working on the house instead, building things, the bench, the lawn chairs. He mended window frames and shingles, painted the exterior walls. He fixed and replaced whatever needed fixing or replacing. The pleasure of straightforward work, work that had felt sure in his hands, the ending already in sight before he had even started. And the knowledge too, that the outcome could only be an improvement. He surrendered himself to each task. The days disappeared, time suspended the best months of his married life, the most peaceful anyhow. I should have been a carpenter, he had said to himself more than once that summer. I should have been Joseph instead of the guy on the cross. Can you do that? Fantastic. <laughs> lovely, lovely piece. How well do you think you got to know Hopper when you were writing that? Very well, I think. Um, I think I sort of become, I think acting and writing are quite similar. You have to become your character. And I started off in a way trying to give Hopper a voice because he had, he had been the victim of some very, very negative press um, on foot of a biography that had come out. His wife wanted to be an artist too. And um, there were accusations made that he held her back and that he was controlling and that he didn't want her to be a painter. And, all this kind of stuff. So I read the biography and I read it. The second time I read it, I started to notice all the negative things that were said were coming from one source and that was from his wife's diary. So then I got a hold of the diary and it's very volatile. She's, you know, a little bit, she was a little bit up and down. And so one moment she would have him as this God-like creature. She'd have him on a pedestal. Oh, he's so good. Oh, he's such a wonderful man. I'm so lucky to have him. And then he would be just the biggest bastard that ever walked the earth. She wanted him to get the gallery owners to, um, to sell her paintings. But the tragedy was, even though she's a very clever woman and she, would, she was extremely well read and um, she just wasn't a good painter when you look at the paintings. So you can see she just wanted to be a painter. She had the soul of a painter, but she just didn't have the ability, you know? Right. Yeah. But anyway, <coughs> she bit him, she bit his hand to the bone and she did all these awful things. But on the way to the end of the book, I actually got quite fond of her. I did get quite fond of her. She got great praise for, praise for that book from uh, Colin McCann. Uh, I'm just looking at my copy here. Yeah. On the cover is uh, brilliant, beguiling, powerful. So... I uh, wish you, we wish you every success and with with those uh, awards coming up. Yeah, that's another thing. I mean, it to be done online. The Docky yeah. Zurich one is the inaugural award, um, which will, which is nice to be included on, I yeah. think. And uh, but anyway, it's it's nice to be there. It doesn't matter really if we don't get to wear the frock and get out, go out to the ceremony. Mm. It's that time of year. Bloomsday beckons. I know. Yeah. Yeah. I've had so many good Bloomsdays, Dennis. I really have. I mean, you know, I could talk all night about the Bloomsdays. 
but we probably only have time to tell you about this one. Mm. Um, I, I'll have a busy day, even though it's, uh, it's you know, it, there'll be no Davy Burns open, there'll be no pubs open, there'll be none of that kind of thing. But um, I'll be on the radio first thing in the morning and I'm going on to talk about uh, a wonderful thing that's happened to Dublin and to the whole idea of Bloomsday and James Joyce and Ulysses and all that. Uh, you know, Swenny's pharmacy chemist in Dublin. Yeah. It's um, in Lincoln. I wasn't, I wasn't entirely sure how you pronounce it. Is I'm it? not sure myself. I, I'm Sweeney's pronouncing it Swenny's because there's only one E in it. But I know one time when I was on Bloomsday, which is a great place to meet, to meet some real know ofs on be corrected, I'm being told, even though it's, uh, and it was actually a Dutch guy who said it to me, even though it's called, uh, it's called, it looks like it, it's, you pronounce it Sweeney. But anyway, I'm, I don't know if I believed him. He was, he was well drunk at the time. But anyway, we'll say, nonetheless, it's the same shop. But anyway, it's no longer operates as a pharmacy, as we know. It's now dedicated to, to uh, Joyce. And it's run by volunteers, but they've kept everything in the shop as if it was a chemist. And they sell his books and they sell that lovely lemon soap that's, uh, that Bloom buys when he goes in. Oh. And... Uh, they're being threatened to have been closed down simply because they can't afford the rent. It's been doubled and they're in dire straits uh, for the, you know, financially, they have no support. Does Johnny Ronan own it? No, he don't. Yeah, no. It wouldn't be just doubled if it was Johnny Ronan. God, you're joking me. But anyway, he, um, the, there's, uh, the, the, all these volunteers work. But the T.S. Eliot estate have decided that they're going to donate £5,000 sterling per annum every year. To the upkeep of the of the of the place, which is wonderful, I think. That is fantastic. So will, I'm going will, to I, I'm going to be there that day. Will that pay the rent? Um, I don't know. Will it pay the rent? Might pay the. I don't know. I don't know. But it'll certainly help them. They've raised funds themselves. It's a place that anybody can go into any time, and they nearly they have you know readings of Ulysses, and there could be a professional actor in there, or it could just be somebody who's just learning to discover. I was just learning about Joyce or just, just beginning to discover Ulysses and there's readings and you can go in and they'll always give you a cup of tea and they'll give you, you know, the really nice people who volunteer, the, the volunteers in there and the owner is a lovely fellow PJ. They're really nice people. But there's Elizabeth, the Irish artist Elizabeth Cope has painted a beautiful painting and I'm going to unveil that. That's my job. Wonderful. So I'm really yeah. looking forward to that. And there'll be social distancing. All, all the way, social distancing. Yeah. I have a very nice Bloomsday story, if we've time. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I tell you about this. Please. Many moons ago, in the early days when I do Bloomsday, and I'd always dress up in the high collar and the hair all up and the, you know, the button back boots and the works. But it used to be a long day and a lot of drink would be consumed. And uh, this particular year, anyway, um, we went, we started by going out to the, the Sandy Mount, or to Sandy Mount for the breakfast. And then we came out to the graveyard scene in Glasnevin. Then into Davy Burns, and you know, you have a drink here and a drink there. Anyway, suffice to say, by the end of the evening, we were in the Arts Club, which is on Fitzwilliam Street, and I was badly in need of a breath of fresh air. So I went out, it's still in my gear now, and up the road and to Fitzwilliam Square, and I sat on a step to have a rest, not realizing that this is where the girls worked, the street girls are working there. And, and they all thought I was bring, trying to bring to muscle in. Not only was I muscling in on their territory, but I was also given a new line, you know, showing a different yeah. kind of thing, you know. So anyway, luckily enough, I was drunk enough to excuse them all to them. And they sat down beside me and I gave them a great, um, a great uh, short and slightly slurred lesson about Ulysses. Um, so what the, the, the night, the night town there. episode in particular. <laughs> I didn't mention that actually, I thought that'd be a bit mean, but anyway, I'm one of them said, I must read that now. So uh, anyway, it was great fun. Yeah, fantastic story to, to finish with. Yeah. Christine, it's been wonderful having you. Are you working on anything at the moment? Or have you got I am, on? I'm working. We, last year we went to London for three months, much to the horror of our adult children, saying, why are you going? Because we can. And I'm reading a novel about a boxer and a barmaid, I think it's, in, and a trumpet player, I think it's set, it's set in the 70s, a little bit in the 70s in London. It's about people who kind of went there and got lost. They never came back and they can't come back, they couldn't come back. But I might have to change it now, COVID is going to change everything. It's like when mobile phones came out, they changed the plot of everything because you keep thinking. 
Yeah, but I mean, if it's going to be set in the Change. 70s, you won't have to. So, worry. yeah, it wouldn't be, but it's going to be about them now and looking back on the 70s. I've some of yeah. it, but so I'll yeah. work on that. I'm working well, on that. That sounds like a very intriguing menage à toi. We'll see. <laughs> we'll a see. boxer, a trumpet player, and a barman. I, uh, I had a great time with the boxing. I even took boxing lessons in, oh. in a, a club in uh, London with really, really London. It was great fun. Your dedication to your research is amazing. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. I did know. you take up painting after? I did. did I painted Cape Cod morning. I pa it's the most difficult. You know the thing about Hopper? I even took, I tried it myself. Now, I wouldn't be bad. I wouldn't be an artist, but you know, it would have been okay art in school and that. I was good at art. And I'd be all right at copying something. Really, Cape Cod morning is a very, very difficult painting. And it looks as if geometrically everything is sound, but it's his own architecture. It's just nobody else seems to do it. And I even got a very good professional artist to go through with me, to paint it with me. And she had difficulty doing it as well. But I did it. Like, it's not, nobody's going to mix it up with the real thing now by any manner or means, but I did it. I have it. Yeah. Well, Christine, it's been great to finally have a real Dubliner on the glass. <laughs> the very okay. first. It's been yeah. a real pleasure and thank you for being so generous with your oh, time. Oh, not at all. Thank yeah. you. And thank I you. encourage everybody listening to uh, spend the rest of the summer catching up on your catalogue. You have a lovely website, no? I have a website, yeah. It's a yeah. bit, they probably think it's my daughter in the picture because I haven't got the picture changed. But anyway, it's, it's, that's laziness, not vanity. Yeah. So what's the website? It's uh, Christine Dwyer Hickey. Dot, I dot, suppose dot www yeah, well, you can Google yeah. it and you can find it. It's a very good yeah. website, very informative, and you can catch up on all Christine's many, many titles. I mean, you've written what nine novels now, Christine? Is it? This is my ninth. I yeah. I think it's my, this is my ninth, is it? My short story, yeah. yeah. And the collection of short stories as well. Yeah. So they're all very much, very well worth reading. So thanks a million, Christine. Oh, thank hope, you, Dennis. Hope to see you next time in Listo. Oh, I hope so. We'll, we'll yeah. catch up with all the celebrations. Okay, right. take care. All thanks a lot, Christine. Good night, everybody. Talk to you next week. Good night, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Owen.